in chapter two of your textbook, Nutrition for Support and Exercise Fourth Edition. The topic is defining and measuring energy. I encourage you to take advantage of the true false questions that are in your textbook. Number one, true or false, the scientific unit of measure of food energy is the calorie. That is true. In the United States, we refer to food energy as calories. In Australia, though, for example, the unit of measure is the kilojoule. Number two, true or false, a person's resting metabolic rate can change in response to a variety of factors, such as age, food intake, and environmental temperature. That's true. An individual's resting metabolic rate, also known as the RMR, can change in response to a variety of factors. As we get older, our resting metabolic rate tends to decrease. Food intake, the type of macronutrient that you consume, can affect your metabolic rate and environmental temperature, as we'll see. An increase in altitude can increase metabolic rate as well. Number three, physical activity is responsible for the largest amount of energy expended during the day for the average adult in the United States. That is false. The largest part of our energy expenditure is our basal metabolic rate that makes up about 65% of the energy we expend every day or more. There's the thermic effect of food. And then there's physical activity that make up energy expenditure. And we will have the opportunity to look at exactly how much each makes up approximately in the United States. Number four, the energy source used by all cells in the body is adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. That is true. ATP is the energy source used by all cells in the body. And there are a number of different energy systems besides glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to produce ATP and chapters three and four focus on the energy systems. Be familiar with the terminology presented in chapter two on energy. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to define and explain bioenergetics. Be able to explain the concepts of energy transfer and utilization of the body, be able to identify the primary source of energy in the body and how it is used during skeletal muscle during exercise. Also be able to explain how the energy content of food and energy expenditure are measured directly and measured indirectly and how the most accurate estimates can be made. Be able to list and explain the components of the energy balance equation. Also be familiar with factors that influence metabolic rate, how metabolic rate is measured or predicted, and the impact of physical activity on energy expenditure. Bioenergetics is the ability to transfer energy, specifically the ability to convert foodstuffs into biologically useful energy. Energy is defined as the ability to perform work. And there are many tasks in the body that require an energy. Energy is required for chemical reactions, electrical reactions like nerve impulse signals, mechanical work like walking and transportation of cells and protein through the blood. 
The, con the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy, and it states that within a closed system, energy is neither destroyed or created. So what happens? Energy is transferred. Energy can be stored for future use or released when in need. There are two types of reactions that release and store energy. Exergonic reactions are reactions that produce energy, while endergonic reactions are reactions that store energy. The name potential energy is given to energy that is stored for future use. For example, there's potential energy within the bonds of ATP, or if you want to imagine, I think your book gives the example of a dam holding back water. The water has potential energy. If the dam would break and the water spilled over, that would be termed kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is released to perform work. This clip from your book is figure 2.2 .2 in the fourth edition of your textbook and illustrates how efficient or inefficient the human body can be at accomplishing external work. In this example, a male cyclist who weighs 150 pounds is on a bike at 180 watts. In lab settings, such as this, exercise oxygen consumption can be measured. Resting oxygen consumption can also be measured using direct calorimetry. There are conversion tables in the front of the book that list conversion factors. So some factors that you need to know for this example are that one watt is equivalent to 0 0.0143 calories per minute. So if this person is cycling at 180 watts, you can calculate the external work performed in calories per minute, abbreviated kcal per min. Oxygen is given a caloric value. One liter of oxygen is estimated to contain about five calories in the human body. And one liter is equivalent to 1,000 milliliters. An example of potential energy and kinetic energy can be explained using the example of water stored in a reservoir behind a dam. In this example, if the dam breaks, the force of moving water released is an example of kinetic energy. However, potential energy describes the water that is stored behind the dam. It has the potential to do work. This is a good example of endergonic versus exergonic reactions. Endergonic reactions store energy. So with a mouse trap, if you were to set the trap, you would store energy. That is an endergonic reaction. Exergonic reactions release energy. So when the mouse trap is activated, it 
it will release energy, and that is an exergonic reaction. The energy currency of living things is ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate. This special molecule is able to store energy in its phosphate bonds. If you look closely at the structure, you will notice that there are some wavy lines between the bonds of the phosphate groups within ATP. These wavy lines indicate that these are unstable bonds. And these unstable bonds can be transferred to other molecules, making them more reactive. Adenosine diphosphate, also known as ADP, is a chemical compound that is formed by the breakdown of ATP to release energy and achieved by the hydrolysis of ATP in which H2O is added to adenosine triphosphate to break some of its bonds. The breakdown of ATP into ADP does require an enzyme called ATPase. In addition to ADP, an inorganic phosphate is produced from the breakdown of ATP and energy is released from the bonds broken in ATP. This is figure 2.8 from your textbook and it shows the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. Um, if you look at the steps, um, you will see pink myosin filaments and green actin filaments. The myosin filaments have thick heads that contain ATP. When myosin binds with um, a part of the actin filament, ATP can be broken down and reduce and energy released along with the creation of ADP. This produces the force of skeletal muscles. ATP is stored in the muscles and can be found in the myosin heads. The human body can rephosphorylate ATP or add energy back to ADP by adding an inorganic phosphate and energy. This is an endergonic reaction because energy is stored and is called rephosphorylation because a phosphorus molecule is added to ADP. ATP can be replenished in the body using three different energy systems we'll discuss in chapter three. They include creatine phosphate, anaerobic glycolysis, and oxidative phosphorylation. ATP in the muscle is replenished extremely rapidly. However, levels of ATP in the muscle during exercise rarely drop more than 20 to 30 percent. A calorie is defined as the amount of energy that is required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. In the United States, the energy in foods are communicated using calories as the energy unit. However, in some other countries, the joule is used to express the energy in food. And there's an example of 
a nutrition fact label that uses calories versus one that uses joules. One calorie is equivalent to 4.184 joules. This clip shows energy measurements used on food labels in the United States on the left and in Australia on the right. In Australia, serving sizes are expressed in the number of grams. And instead of calories as the unit of energy measure, kilojoules are used. On the nutrition label on the left, The serving size is given in cups and energy is given in calories. Energy expenditure can be measured using calorimetry. Calorimetry is a method of determining energy content of food or energy expended. The amount of energy that a person expends or the amount of foodstuffs, um, energy in food, can be measured by direct calorimetry. A direct Calorimetry tool can be something like a bomb calorimeter, which is featured on the next slide. There's also information in your textbook about it, or it can be a room size calorimeter. Direct calorimetry estimates energy content by measuring changes in thermal or heat energy while indirect calorimetry can estimate energy expenditure by measuring changes in oxygen consumption by a person and or carbon dioxide production. And there are a number of examples on the next uh, couple of slides. Some metabolic measurement systems include a system that can measure resting oxygen consumption. Rest oxygen is given a caloric value. One liter of oxygen contains approximately five calories. Okay, and be reminded that one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters. The resting metabolic rate gives an estimate in calories per unit of time that tells you the number of calories you burn while you are awake and alert but resting. Uh, we'll also talk about basal metabolic rate and the difference between resting metabolic rate and basal metabolic rate. Here's a closer picture of the bomb calorimeter. Food is placed in the device and heated up to burn it. Um, the food is surrounded by water. This water changes temperature as the food is burned. Um, the temperature change can be used or is used to estimate the number of calories in food. This table lists the energy content of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and alcohol as determined by a bomb calorimeter. And the last column shows the number of calories that we can utilize from each of these. 
So carbohydrates, when burn in a bomb calorimeter, produces 4.2 calories per gram. Humans can use all of it for energy. Fats in a bomb calorimeter produce 9.4 kilocalories of energy for every gram, of which we can use all of it. Proteins produce 5.7 kilocalories of energy for every gram burned in a bomb calorimeter, while the human body can use approximately 4.2 grams of that Alcohol gives off seven calories per gram, or contains seven calories per gram, um, as determined by a bomb calorimeter. The human calorimeter, or we can use uh, all of those calories in alcohol most of the time. However, whenever you overconsume alcohol, your body will stop processing carbohydrates, fats, and proteins and try to detoxify alcohol in your body. So your liver tries to get rid of alcohol and stop metabolizing carbohydrate, fats, and proteins. There are some facilities that contain whole room calorimeters that are capable of both direct and indirect calorimetry, which means they measure both changes in heat or thermal energy and changes in oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. So they can be used to estimate energy expenditure. This is a picture of an open circuit metabolic measurement system that can be used to measure oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. Here is an example of indirect calorimetry. There are portable systems for measuring resting metabolic rate. Here is one here. In order to measure accurately oxygen and carbon dioxide gases, your ability to breathe in and out through your nose has to be restricted or you have to have a mask like in the previous picture that covers your whole um, face. Here's a portable metabolic measurement system that allows measurement of energy expenditure during unrestricted activity. So you can be out doing your regular activity, training for Olympics, whatever, and also use this system. The next section discusses the energy balance equation. The energy balance equation, most simply put, is energy in equals energy out. On the energy in side, the only factor is food or our diet, what we ingest. Our calories from carbohydrate fats, and proteins. That's energy in. Energy out is made up of three components that include the resting metabolic rate, which is sometimes um, used interchangeably with the basal metabolic rate, but is a little different. The basal metabolic rate is a little lower. Uh, the second component of energy out is the thermic effect of food and the third component is physical activity and physical activity is said to be the uh, part of the energy out equation that we have the most control over energy is in balance when energy in is equal to energy out and if this happens over time and weight, a person's weight will remain. In research studies, 
that require self-reported food intake, or if you see a dietitian and they ask you to self-report food intake, it is important to be as accurate as possible. In fact, some older nutrition research studies, such as the Nurses Health Study, have been called into question because of inaccuracies with people reporting underreporting or misreporting their food intake. In the Nurses Health Study, fiber intake is estimated. However, the way the question is worded and asked um, can mislead people to believe that they're consuming high fiber foods when they're not, okay? Also, um, if you, some people think that if you eating a bread that is brown, that it is whole wheat or whole grain. Um, when it not necessarily always is. Um, there is the argument in this textbook that uh, counting calories can be cumbersome. However, if you do that for, you know, a little while, a few weeks, a few times a week out of the month, um, you can get an idea of how many calories you're taking in. Anyway, um, it is important to be accurate, express portion sizes correctly, and people don't always do that. Food intake is typically underestimated by 15 to 20 percent. People tend to forget what they ate or just don't count it. Also, errors in data entry can occur, and that can occur with um, any study. There are apps that allow you to keep track of the food that you ingest. There's a new app, I haven't tried it yet, that allows you to photograph food and it can give you a rough estimate of its nutrient content. There are foods where you can um, scan, I'm sorry, there are apps where you can scan barcodes into an electronic food diary. The components of energy expenditure are listed here. While energy in is only affected by our diet, energy out has three components, which include physical activity, the thermic effect of food, and resting metabolism, with resting metabolism making up most of a person's daily energy expenditure. It can account for up to 70% of the day's total energy. The thermic effect of food accounts for approximately 10% of energy that is expended. And physical activity components account for about 20%. You may have heard basal metabolic rate and resting metabolic rate used interchangeably. The BMR or basal metabolic rate is a measure of the amount of energy per unit of time usually given in calories per day in the United States that are necessary to keep the body alive when you are at complete rest. So if you um, were to end up in a coma, your basal metabolism would still require about 12, 1300 calories minimum, okay? The resting metabolic rate gives a figure that's a little higher than basal metabolic rate. This is the amount of energy required by the body to maintain a non-active but alert state. This table highlights different factors that affect resting metabolic rate. This table divides these factors into three different categories. The first category are factors that influence resting metabolic rate but are not under voluntary control. These include things like your gender, your genetics, your age, your height, and the amount of thyroid hormones that you produce. Your genetics may predispose you to burning 
less or more calories. As you go from being an adult to an older adult, your resting metabolic rate decreases naturally. How tall you are determines metabolic rate. The taller you are, the more calories you burn. Thyroid hormones are used to regulate metabolic rate, body temperature, digestion, and a number of other things. If you are deficient in thyroid hormone because either your diet or because of um, you have an autoimmune disease that causes your immune cells to attack its thyroid and you're at risk for having a low metabolic rate. The second category includes factors that have a substantial influence on resting metabolic rate and are under some voluntary control. For example, self-restricted food intake has a substantial influence. If you restrict your food intake to a point um, to where you are severely deficient in calories, it will reduce your resting metabolic rate. The amount of fat-free tissue has a substantial influence. The amount of muscle tissue you have influences resting metabolic rate. The more muscle tissue you have, the more calories you're likely to burn. And finally, factors that have a subtle or temporary influence and are under voluntary control include exercise. Exercise greatly increases your resting metabolic rate also the environmental temperature. If you're really cold, your body might expend energy to try to warm itself up. As you go to a higher altitude, going to higher altitudes will increase resting metabolic rate by an estimated 15 or 25 percent. That is um, significant. It is transient and resting metabolic rate will return to normal after um, one to three weeks after returning to sea level. Caffeine intake can increase or resting metabolic rate for a period of time. There are other ways to estimate energy expenditure, such as prediction equations. One such prediction equation is the Mifflin-St. Jor equation. This can be used if you are trying to get a rough estimate of resting metabolic rate and you do not have access to sophisticated equipment. The Mifflin-St. Jor equation differs for males and females. It requires weight, height, and age and gives you an approximate resting metabolic rate in kilocalories per day. So if you want to estimate the number of calories you're burning, you can use the appropriate equation for your gender, plug in your weight in kilograms, your height in centimeters, and your age in years. For your weight in kilograms, take your weight in pounds and divide it by 2.2 to get your height in centimeters first convert your height to inches when you have your height in inches divide inches by 2.54 and you will get your height in centimeters and you can go on to estimate your resting metabolic rate another prediction equation that can be used to estimate energy is the cunningham equation this equation requires that the athlete using the equation have an estimate of their body composition or an estimate of their fat-free mass. In this example, a female endurance athlete age 23, 66 inches tall with a weight of 135 pounds has a body composition estimate of 20% body fat. This estimate can be used to determine the approximate 
kilograms of body fat this person contains and their fat-free mass. Fat-free mass is then plugged into the equation. Um, this estimate or example comes out to 1580 calories per day. For the same individual using the mifflin saint Joe equation, um, this results in a higher estimate, 14% um, higher than what's obtained with the mifflin saint Joe equation. The simplified resting metabolic rate formula is another prediction equation or set of prediction equations that can be used to calculate metabolic rate based on gender. It is a quick ballpark calculation that estimates males burn one calorie per kilogram of body weight for every hour and women burn 0.9 kilograms per kilogram of body weight per hour. So if you know your weight, you can use that to determine an approximate metabolic rate using the simplified formula. The thermic effect of food is a component of energy expenditure estimated to be approximately 10% of your total calorie intake. This is energy expended to digest and absorb the food that you intake. Consuming protein foods increase the thermal effect of food more so than carbohydrates. The overall effect, however, can be very small, but it does cost your body a little bit more energy to digest and absorb proteins than it does carbohydrates. Any kind of physical activity that you're doing requires energy expenditure above your resting metabolism. Physical activity increases your resting metabolic rate. It is said to be the most and easily influenced factor that determines energy expenditure and it is the most variable. This figure shows three different levels of activity and how that activity can increase overall metabolism. If you compare a sedentary person to a person who is physically active or a person who exercises regularly, then overall energy expenditure increases. Here are some more estimates that you can use to estimate how many calories you need in a day based on your activity level and your gender. So take your weight in pounds and divide by 2.2 to get kilograms and then you can um, multiply that weight by the appropriate energy expenditure value to get an approximate number of calories that you burn each day. So in summary, energy can exist in a variety of forms and can be transferred from one type to another. The first law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, energy is neither destroyed or created. The energy that is contained in our food is converted into different types of energy that are used by the body, such as chemical energy, energy for transportation, energy for mechanical movement. Energy that is consumed in excess will be stored for later use as fat. Energy expenditure can be determined by different methods indirect calorimetry, direct calorimetry, or you can use prediction equations.
direct calorimetry measures the energy in our food directly or can measure changes in temperature. Indirect calorimetry measures changes in oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. The energy balance equation is energy in, energy out. This is the simplest way to illustrate energy balance. Food is the only factor on the energy inside, while on the energy outside, you have resting metabolism, the thermic effect of food, and physical activity, all affecting energy expenditure. Some athletes um, tend to under consume calories and they end up in a state of energy depletion. This is termed LEA or low energy availability. This condition will rob you of your performance. So it is important to have some idea of how many calories you need, especially if you're an athlete. Um, and Make sure you're getting the appropriate amounts of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in your diet. 